so good morning or good afternoon or good evening wherever you are in the world. Uh, Talent Finders would like to welcome entrepreneur, author, philanthropist and international speaker Indaba Mandela. So welcome Indaba. Thank you very much. Uh, so Indaba, I'd like to congratulate you on all your achievements. So can you please share with us how your entrepreneurial journey started? Well, in all honesty, it started like with most entrepreneurs, is you find yourself behind a computer at your desk and, you know, looking forward to lunchtime and after lunchtime, looking forward to six o'clock when you knock off. Yes. And I realized that this is just not the way I want my life to be. Yes. And so I decided that I would need to start my own company, my own organization in order to truly pursue what it is that I believe in and what I want to dedicate myself to. And that wasn't really the pursuit of money as such. It was more establishing Africa Rising back in 2010. Yes. And of course, we quickly realized that as much as we have lofty ideas of trying to empower young people, we also have the challenge of making sure that we also live a good life that will be able to support our lifestyle, of course, with our kids as well. So it's, it's, it's been really a learning journey, but an, an amazing one that I would never change for anything. Yeah, amazing. Um, so you speak all over the world um, a lot um, and you talk a lot about leadership and youth. Um, we are living uh, through some very turbulent times on a global scale dealing with COVID-19 um, and really huge uncertain times, racism and frankly unnecessary killings um, mm. and just such a lack um, of leadership in general which is heartbreaking. So what do you believe through the lessons of your grandfather, Mr. Nelson Mandela? Um, what do you believe he taught you in terms of leadership? And what do you believe uh, needs to change on a global and domestic level to change the current narrative? <clears throat> I think we need to understand and realize that we need to be our leaders ourselves. We can no longer look out there for others to take the first step. Yes. This is a time when we have to realize that each of us have the potential to be a leader. Each of us have values and principles that, you know, when you look at Nelson Mandela, that is a man who believed in equality, freedom, justice, and love, yeah. and sacrificed himself and his family Absolutely. in order to pursue those goals. So. For me, it's really about having a clear vision, yes. having a clear purpose in life. Yes. And I believe you'll be able to, 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 to pursue that with integrity. Now, yes. when you look at the current state of the world, yes, you know, young people are, are stressed. Nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Nobody knows if, you know, when this thing going to end. Do, do I have to repeat another year at university, at college? You know, am I ever going to graduate? Um, the, the, the only thing that we can say right now yes. to the world is adhere to the government measures that have been actually put out there. Stay at home, you know, practice social distancing, you know, you know, keep, keep your space very clean at all times. Hygiene is of, is of critical importance. Yes. Um, and it is important during this time, ladies and gentlemen, that we support and work together in order for us to go through this. You see, there are thousands of child-headed households in South Africa. Yes. There are situations, as you know, Karen, where kids' only meals that they get are at school. Absolutely, yes. And so when the kids have no more school, that means they don't get fed. And so it has really caused a critical, dire situation. And the only way we're going to be able to deal with these issues is when government, corporates, civil society come together, work together through these challenges to find the solutions. And above all, it is important that they include young people in these conversations when they are strategically thinking about how to work through these challenges right now technology, entrepreneurship, you know, ideas, these are, are the times to allow young people to lead, 
you know, they are the ones who are really going to take us to the next level of existence as, as humanity. Yeah. So, you know, the, the system has shown that there are so many cracks in the system, right? Absolutely. And it's up to us as individuals to make sure that wherever you see a racial slur, you see somebody treating somebody unfairly because of race, we can no longer turn the other cheek. We can no longer turn a blind eye. We have to stamp out the ugly face of prejudice, wherever it may be. Absolutely. And, you know, this is not a Black Lives Matter issue. It is a world issue. Yeah. And the world needs to understand that, yes, all lives matter. However, in this moment and at this time, it's about Black lives. Yeah, exactly. Hundred mm. percent. Um, so I want to talk about um, your recent uh, book or, you know, the, your book that you launched, Going to the Mountain. You wrote this book about your relationship with your late grandfather, Mr. Nelson Mandela, or McLeaver as we know him. Um, mm. uh, can you share with us a little bit more about the book and why it was so important to you to write a book from a more personal and intimate perspective? Um, and how was growing up and being raised by such a beloved world iconic figure and yet keeping so grounded. So how and what compelled you to write the book in this way? Well, the one thing I wanted to, to do is to, to let the memory of Madiba not, you know, leave it in history books. Of course. You know, there are countless books written about Nelson Mandela, the leader, the revolutionary the president. Yeah. Yeah. But I wanted Nelson Mandela to connect with the young people more as a grandfather because all young people can relate to a grandparent. Yes. And so through writing this book through the eyes of a grandson, you know, it brings him much closer to young people. And I don't want young people to be able to relate to Nelson Mandela and see him as a grandfather-like figure so yes. that they can actually, you know, learn learn from him and see him as as as, as a grandfather not as yes. a president Absolutely. and so in the book it's really about my journey how i've traveled you know from being born in eastern cape or being born actually in soweto then moving to the eastern cape and then being when i was 11 years old when i was in johannesburg living in soweto my grandfather coming to fetch me uh, just before he was president when i was about 11 years old yes um, and, you know, being with my grandfather, he was very strict. Um, and he wanted my room to be neat at all times. He would, he would scold me every now and again when my room was in a mess. Yes. <laughs> um, as you know, he was a military man. He, he trained six months military in, in, in uh, Ethiopia, six months in Algeria, and yes. became the first commander in chief of the military arm of the, of the ANC. And so, you know, he was very disciplined. Of course. Um, and he, he would take runs in the morning at about five in the morning. Um, and he would, you know, breakfast, lunch at the specific time every day, no matter what. Yeah. And what I loved about my grandfather is that, you know, growing up with him, there would be a Bill Clinton coming for a visit, a Fidel Castro coming for a visit, a Lennox Lewis coming for a visit. And my grandfather, what is so special, watching him, treated these people who were kings and queens the very same way he treated Mama Kholi, who cooked breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yes. And Albert, who cleaned the garden, and Bramai, who was just a driver. Because Nelson Mandela understands that regardless of your gender, your sex, your age, your dynamics, or even your history, we all have the potential to find that inner peace and to bring out that greatness that lies within all of us. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing. Um, so do you feel having been raised by such a great leader um, has influenced and shaped your leadership style? And if so, what are some of the unique attributes of your leadership style that makes you different? Many may say that there, um, those are big shoes to fill. Um, but what do you think your grandfather would say to you in terms of uh, your leadership? Well, uh, I'm not sure what he would say. <laughs> um, I am, I'd like to think of myself as a fair leader. 
I like to think of myself as understanding that when there are issues and problems or challenges that there's always one way to there's more than one way to skin a cat and there's always more than three different storylines to whatever issue arose so you need to be patient you need to listen more than you speak yeah and i tell kids god gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason so you can listen more than you speak yeah (laughs) you know um so that's more my my kind of leadership style more of a fair you know, let everyone participate, let everyone contribute, and then we will uh, together see which are the most strongest points and what strategically makes sense, not only for us, but for our partners involved as well. Absolutely. Now, um, what was the other question? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's just, um, uh, you know, literally just asking you um, about, you know, what um, Madiba would have said um, about your leadership style. But, you know, obviously that, you know, just in, in terms of what you think he would have said to you, you know, if he was still alive today. Oh, I think he'd be okay. Uh, he influenced me in every single way, you know. Yes. Um, his values, his principles became my own. Yeah. And so our leadership is really about putting people first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of your many passions you have is for education and the importance of education. You have earned and worked hard achieving a bachelor's degree from the University of Pretoria, majoring in political science and international relations. There is a strong focus on education. So while you were growing up and having achieved your, your degree, which uh, set your foot path to international travel, giving you opportunities to learn um, and experience different cultures. So how has this helped you in your entrepreneurial journey? And do you believe that this has opened uh, doors to other opportunities? Yes. I mean, when you're studying politics, you you learn about the different systems um, that exist in the world, uh, from Europe, from America to Africa. Obviously, you learn about the international trade and the political economy. Um, so it definitely does, you know, uh, set the world stage for you yes. in terms of who are the who are the real players in the international stage, who has the real power, the influence, and who are who are members and who are followers. Yes. Um, <clears throat> but I think you know the ultimate thing that will give anybody that edge is really that experience, you know, from one yeah. country to the next, from one culture to the next, you open up your mind and you see how different people do the same thing differently. Yeah. You know, that really is an eye opener. And uh, um, yes, of course, education is, is desired. And, you know, it really does set us, uh, uh, set us apart in terms of the how you're able to communicate, how you're able to critically make decisions. So education can never be something that we take advantage of or, or even, or even, um, you know, don't take seriously. As you know, we have generations before us that were denied education. And so it's important, especially here in South Africa, that our people who are poor and can only go to public schools you know, also have facilities that will enable them to access information and to surf the World Wide Web. Yeah, absolutely. So you have a passion for philanthropy and giving back, which is really significant for you. I'm having grown up both in the Eastern Cape and Johannesburg, South Africa, and seeing Mm -hmm. the challenges of rural South Africa, lack of educational materials and basic supplies, as well as healthcare issues and HIV Um, in the country, specifically in rural communities. Um, You started your own foundation called Africa Rising, as well as a registered nonprofit in the US. So can you share with us more about this and what is your main objective for Africa Rising? Um, And how, and sorry, and how would you like to have uh, people involved in supporting your nonprofit? And what is your biggest vision for Africa Rising and your US uh, nonprofit going forward? Okay, so Africa Rising was established in 2010, and it was really to to be a catalyst and and a, and a propeller for young people to gain yeah. access to tools and resources so that they can break the cycle of poverty. Yeah. So we do coding classes. We've done. We've taught up to about 
over 300 boys and girls in the Mtata, in the poorest region of the country. Oh. We have done career guidance where we partnered with the South African Air Force, where they would come in and tell the young kids, actually they would come with the chopper to the village. Wow, and you that's can imagine amazing. the excitement of the kids' faces who've never even seen a, 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 a mm -hmm. chopper chop up. I can imagine. And, uh, yeah, and the pilot is a black pilot, and you know, they talk, tell them the life story, how he became a pilot. And, you know, in that, you, 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 you're softly promoting science and maths as, as, the, as the tools, again, you know, to, to be able to have these opportunities. Yes. Um, we've partnered with NetBank, we've partnered with Unilever, you know, talking about uh, female hygiene. We've done a uh, literacy class with NetBank. Um, yes. We've also done agricultural programs where we're actually distributing uh, vegetable seeds to promote household farming. Yeah. Um, we, you know, and ultimately we, we see ourselves as an organization where young people can actually empower themselves to be at the forefront of the development that's taking place in Africa. Why yes. should the development always be in the hands or in the direction of the Western world? We need to be in a position where we put young people in key positions so that they can influence how we develop moving forward. Yes. And that's what Africa Rising is there for. And then on the other hand, last year we then uh, established the Mandela Institute for Humanity in America, because we know that this is where the biggest decision makers of the world are, right? When you look yes, at the absolutely. biggest corporations and organizations, that most of them are in New York. Yes. And so rather than, you know, going through up the ladder to try and get one decision made in South Africa, rather have a presence where the big dogs are, right? Yes. And, and so there, the, the, the real focus is on leadership, right? We want to unpack Nelson Mandela and say, what kind of leader was he? You know, he was humble, he was disciplined, he had a vision, he was passionate, but he had a lot of compassion as well. Yes. And how do we unpack these different values and then show young people how they can use them in their daily life, whether it be at school, whether it be, you know, in the sports field or in, in the office? Yeah, or in their um, own communities, I suppose. Yeah, well. or in their own community, exactly. So we want to try to inspire young people to to become leaders like Nelson Mandela. Wouldn't the world be a better place if we had more Mandelas? Absolutely, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, so you embarked on your entrepreneurial journey um, and you worked um, in the corporate world for a period of time. Would you say this helped you when you decided to start your own business and nonprofit and what do you believe you do better? Well, I definitely think, you know, that it helped me a lot because I always wanted to learn about the economy and business. Yes. And so I was lucky to have an opportunity to join Investec, Investec Asset Management. Yes. Um, where I learned a lot. Um, yes, it helped me, of course. Um, you know, having a job obviously helps you put food on the table, but it also increased my knowledge on how the economy works as well. Yes. Um, and I, I wouldn't change it again for, for anything because of the, the experience that I gained and the people that I met, you yes. know, have become sometimes valuable for future endeavors. Absolutely. It's all about relationships, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, so having spoken um, all over the world, um, to uh, uh, all, all across the world, to many different cultures um, on the world stages, uh, what do you, what surprises you the most and what are some of the biggest rumors or theories about South Africa that you have to dispel? <laughs> I know a few myself, but yeah. Yes. I mean, people, of course, they, they recently have been lying and telling people that, you know, white people are being attacked. It's reverse apartheid, uh, which is all nonsense. We all know yeah. that, me and you, Karen. Yeah. Of course. Um, Oh no, it's reverse apartheid. That's absolute hogwash. <laughs> There's no such thing. Yeah, exactly. People are living nice here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? Um, the people you need to worry about in South Africa are the poor people, not, not anybody else. No, exactly. And that goes across the board. Whether you're black, Indian, or white, you, if you're poor, those are the people that need help. Yes. Um, you know, I would say we are just trying ultimately 
to create a more fair and just world. Okay. And the world has started to rise together. And you have seen the movements okay. around the world in over 17 countries shouting the name of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. Because the world has realized that, you know, justice is not just for, for one, pe one person. Justice is for humanity. Okay. And how are we going to progress as, as, as a people yeah. if there are still people in our society that are being marginalized and not treated as equal? Okay. And so this is an issue that I'm so proud of where to see countries like, you know, Spain, Canada, Germany, you know, rising Sweden. up, Sweden, rising up, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. to, 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 to stand for justice and shouting the black man's name to say enough is enough. We cannot take this anymore. Yeah. The system needs to change. The laws need to change. How we conduct ourselves, how we engage with each other needs to change. Absolutely. And so, I, you know, although COVID has really knocked the economy and so many people are plunged into poverty, you know, there has a, a silver lining in the sense that, number one, the environment, you know, has been, you know, able to breathe once again. Um, uh, and secondly, we as humanity have, you know, come to hopefully look at how, you know, how, how to reflect and, and do some introspection in how we impact not only the people around us, but Mother Earth as well. Of course. And, and also how we I treat each other. How we treat each other, exactly. Yeah. And that's why I think these, these, these protests and marches for George Floyd were so big, because we have the opportunity to actually look at what is happening in our in our in our society absolutely um so i'm sure you've been asked this many times because i i know when i've been around you you've been asked this question um but just for the audience for the sake of the audience um uh without pu uh, pushing pol political things um do you see yourself running for president in North south africa um and given the current challenges that south africa has um, is this a, responsib a responsibility you see yourself taking on, or would you prefer to build and make changes through your own initiatives and nonprofits? You know, politics is a dirty game. It's a dirty game, for sure. If it was up to me, I would run, I would take over this whole damn country, yes. and I would put us back on the right track. 100%. Unfortunately, yeah. you know, when you enter politics, you have to worry about your life, your kids, will you be, you yeah. know. So, I would say yes, but it's, it's, it's something that I always consider versus building the organization, let the organization be that, that catalyst in, yes. in the community that empowers people and gets them through and helps them break the cycle of poverty. Wouldn't yeah. I be doing just as much good as opposed to being a president. Absolutely, absolutely. So COVID-19 has impacted and changed um, our world forever. And obviously we have touched on COVID-19 and you personally went through COVID-19 yourself. So can you share with us what that experience was like and what do you believe through the massive uncertainty and immense challenges, what do you believe we need to do differently and we look um, and how we as a nation and world do things differently to educate better in terms of multiple streams of income? Well, I think, you know, COVID for me, fortunately, wasn't that bad. Yeah. In the sense that me getting the news that I have COVID was much worse than me actually having COVID. Yeah. <laughs> For if sure. you understand what I mean. Yeah. Because right? then suddenly like your mind it, starts playing tricks on yeah. you, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, my, my heart, my, 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 my temperature is going up and down, <laughs> having hot flushes. Oh, no. Now, you don't know, is it real or is it, you know, is it all happening in your mind? Yeah. So I was, I was a bit panicky at the beginning, you know, yeah. not knowing, because also I was one of the first few people to get it in this yeah. country. Yeah. And so, you know, when you get something new, but there's not so much information on it, you tend to panic. Uh, and luckily, I had my friend there, you know, to, to sort of help me through the, the, the news and, and, and yeah. taking it all in. Yeah. But the days that followed after that, you know, I, I really, I was only sick really for two, three days. Yes. Yeah. 
who had a little bit of chest pain, but it wasn't that much different from a heavy flu. Okay. Um, and I think, <clears throat> I mean, obviously this has, 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 has made us re-look re at how we interact physically, okay. right? You know, how we greet each other, how we social distance now. You're conscious about social distancing. You're conscious about how hygienic things. You don't share cigarettes. You don't share, you know, things anymore. So, no. you know, that has had that impact. But I think the bigger impact that it has, has on society at large is really how we impact the world, the environment, you know, and, and really at the end of the day is, is there enough being done to look after marginalized communities? Is there enough being done to look after public schools? Is there enough being done to protect our women society? Yes. These are the serious questions I think COVID has allowed us to actually step back and, and reevaluate and ask ourselves truly, I'm sure we can do more yes, to end some of these, these things that shouldn't be a problem in this time and age. Of course. And then that leads me to the last two questions. Uh, what are the three key pieces of advice you would give to other entrepreneurs um, and what is your ultimate vision for South Africa and what legacy would you like to leave? Well, for entrepreneurs out there, I would say dream big. Dream so big that your dreams scare you. If your yeah. dreams don't scare you, you are not dreaming big enough. 100%. <laughs> and I would say if you're not passionate and in love with the, what you have chosen to do as an entrepreneur, then you're in the wrong place, my friend. Change it immediately. Yes. <laughs> you need to love what you do. You cannot see it as a job. It has to be an extension of yourself almost. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and you know what? If it's not working and you keep hitting your head against the wall, my friend, it's time to move on. A hundred percent. And... As for our country, yes. you know, I believe South Africa is still very much an economic leader as well as a cultural leader in Africa. Yeah. I believe we have a very important role to play in the unification, the reunification of this continent. Yes, I know sure. that there are serious players such as Kenya, Rwanda, Nigeria, Congo, Botswana. Um, Botswana. Um, and I believe that we can through Madiba's uh, lessons, through his ways, we can find means to come together and finally realize the unification of this continent because I know that once this, 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 this continent unites politically, economically, and otherwise, we will see the awakening of a great giant. Yes. And this great giant, there's no need for you to be afraid of him because he's a friendly giant. Yeah, and he wants to sure. see all his children yeah. thriving, growing, learning. Yeah. It's not the giant that comes from Europe or the Western world that wants to keep you in a cage. The ugly, no. Africa is a big friendly giant. So let's, 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 let's awaken him. Let's take off the handcuffs. Let us put on clothes on him. Let us make him fresh, brush his teeth fix his hair and let him fly yeah 100 percent. and ultimately you know that's what i want to see in the world i want to see uh nations working together to to solve common problems you know yeah. and i want to see the eradication of borders in africa and the eradication of the need for a passport to travel you know mm -hmm. um i want our people to be able to work together through borders, through different time zones, um, in, a, in, a, in a way, you know, that humanity has not seen before, but in a way that's not, you know, predatory, like in the capitalist way, you know? 100%. Yeah, for sure. So what legacy would you like to leave, like your personal legacy? My personal legacy. If I can be remembered as a man who worked to unite people of African origin, not only in Africa, but across the world, Oh, die a happy man. Amazing.
So thanks so much for your time in Davo because I know you're busy. So if people want to connect much. with you, um, what are the best pl uh, platforms? The best way is to hit us on Twitter, okay. which is Africa Rising All, one word, or the MIH, Mandela Institute for Humanity, um, and we also have Africa Rising and the Mandela Institute for Humanity. Social media, Twitter, as well as Instagram. Awesome. Well, hopefully we can have you back in the future. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. I got to run. Have a good day. Yeah, bye.